This is the Catherine and Henry J. Geisman Memorial Lecture tonight, and our speaker is Dr. Jonathan Silver. Jonathan Silver holds a PhD in political science and government from Georgetown University and a master's degree in Jewish civilization from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He came to his graduate studies with a BA in political science and classics at Tufts, including a year's study of classics at Oxford. Dr. Silver is currently the senior director of the Tikva Fund, a philanthropic institution that supports activities of intellectual, religious, and political interest with a focus on Jewish life. At the core of its various educational programs is the aim of bringing Jewish thinking into connection with Western political, moral, and economic thought. One of the roles Jonathan Silver plays in the foundation is hosting a series of podcasts, which I and others I know have learned so much from. The interviews he conducts with leading thinkers include conversations on biblical ideas, theology, religious liberty, America, Europe, and Israel, Judeo-Christian dialogue, among others. My students, many of whom are here, <laughs> often hear me speak of the two roots of Western tradition, Bible and Greek philosophy. The history of political theory or political philosophy, which begins with Plato and Aristotle, continues in the medieval world and then runs from the early and later moderns to contemporary philosophers. And this makes up the standard university curriculum. But in recent years, there's been an upsurge of work on the resources of the Hebrew Bible. Turning to the biblical texts through the lens of political philosophy has proven to uncover rich material on themes like family and people, man and woman, covenant and law, equality and freedom, the particularity of the nation and the universality of humankind. Much of this work concerns the political thought of the Bible and its influence on early modern political philosophy. In this sphere, there seems to be a special interest in John Locke whose thought in turn is important for our understanding of liberal democracy and the American founding. Jonathan Silver is well acquainted with this work, but the direction he is pursuing, I believe, involves a distinctive biblical contribution. It is indicated by the title of his dissertation, Unto Thy Children's Children, Lockean Freedom and the Hebraic Horizons of Society and Self. As Dr. Silver writes, Locke taught us that we are free and rational, that reason is our only star and compass. We are in many ways fortunate to live as individuals in a Lockean world. Dr. Silver wants to recover, though, another perspective for which he finds guidance in the Hebrew Bible, where life as an individual in the present moment is enriched by the call of the past through family and memory. I don't know exactly what lies behind his title tonight. What can the Hebrew Bible teach America? But I'm eager to find out. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Silver. Three weeks ago, on October 22nd, an explosive device turned up in the mailbox of the investor and philanthropist, George Soros. The next day, the US Secret Service intercepted a pipe bomb addressed to the former Secretary of State and 2016 presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton. And the day after that, the Secret Service intercepted a bomb addressed to President Obama. The man who sent these explosives also attempted to mail explosives to Vice President Joe Biden. But one was sent to the wrong address, and one was returned for insufficient postage. <laughs> the week that began with the failed attempt to detonate public officials ended with the successful murder of private citizens 
in a house of worship very much like this one. The attack took place inside a synagogue in the suburbs of Pittsburgh. It was Saturday morning Shabbat services when Jewish women and men come together to affirm their covenantal obligations to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to each other and to study the scriptural passages that Jewish congregations all over the world are commanded to study on any given week. This particular portion of Torah reading begins with Genesis 18. And so it was that an armed gunman invaded the spiritual home of the Tree of Life congregation as its members were studying Abraham and Sarah's opening up of their desert home to three needful strangers. On October 27th, 11 congregants from the Tree of Life Synagogue were murdered and six, un six others were injured, including four courageous law enforcement officers who ran into the gunfire to stop the assailant. Law enforcement was not so lucky the next week, excuse me, last week, when on November 7th, the first police officer responding to the scene of another shooting was killed at the borderline bar and grill in Thousand Oaks, California. He was one of 13 Americans killed that day. These last weeks have been tormented and tragic for us as Americans. In each case, a lonely man, armed with guns or homemade explosives, trained his fire on our fellow citizens, none deserving, all now prematurely fallen. Whether you call it mass murder or terrorism or hate crime, I don't think it matters that much. But there is something that cuts across these all too frequent acts of violence. It's almost always a lonely man with a gun. Now, I understand why there should be focus in our public conversations about the gun part. But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I want to think together with you about the lonely man. I want to begin by trying to provide an overview of the prevalence of loneliness in the United States and point to some of its effects. Everyone knows what it means to be lonely, to suffer social rejection, to be ignored, the sleepless, broken-hearted nights of unrequited love. These common experiences of loneliness put us in good stead to begin to understand its deeper meanings. Now, social scientists go about their work by trying to survey respondents to disclose their impressions and their sentiments. Perhaps that's asking too much perspicacity for many of those of us who answer their surveys. But along with the common sense meaning of the term that orients us to what loneliness is, their work does tell us a great deal about the scale of loneliness in our society. We should be attentive this evening to the deeper dispositions, though, of the human soul. Now, one caveat before I go on. Solitude is sometimes a choice. And for some callings of human endeavor, for philosophy, or the highest levels of artistic and scientific genius, perhaps solitude is a necessary choice. But tonight I want to think together with you about loneliness, which is not exactly chosen as much as it is endured. I'm going to try and persuade you, first, that there's a specifically democratic and American form of loneliness. And second, that it, the specifically democratic and American form of loneliness, is the most significant American problem that the Hebrew Bible can provide a powerful and fitting answer. So what can America learn from the Hebrew Bible? From the Hebrew Bible, we can learn how to renew and strengthen the nurturing bonds without which we're destined to continue to grow more frustrated more mistrustful, more unhappy, more polarized, more unhealthy, and less free. Granted, when we think of America's most significant public problems, we tend to think of entitlement spending and the future of health care, immigration, automation, and the changing nature of work, the opioid crisis, America's troubled race relations, the centralization of power in Washington, we tend not to think of the social isolation or its deeper psychic resonances. But perhaps, though not front of mind, loneliness stands at the foundation of very many pressing public policy issues. Former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy believes, quote, that loneliness places the body in a chronic state of stress and increases inflam inflammation levels, increases our risk of cardiovascular disease and other chronic illnesses the mortality effect of associated with loneliness, he writes, 
is even similar to the life shortening that we see smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The data, he concludes, is that loneliness is killing us. And so the industry most attentive to the things that kill us, the insurance industry, has started to pay attention to loneliness. This year, the massive global health insurance company Cigna released a US loneliness index, which, for which it surveyed 20,000 Americans using the UCLA loneliness scale. Now, the survey offers, I have to say, troubling findings, including the observation that the generation of students here tonight in this room at Tulane University, ages 18 to 22, as well as millennials, age 23 to 37, are much lonelier than older generations. To be known and to be needed is a fundamental drive of human nature. But across all ages, classes, races, religions, more than half of the respondents told Cigna that they always or sometimes feel like no one knows them well. Two in five lack companionship, find their relationships lack meaning, and report that they're not close to anyone. The bottom line conclusion of this report is that Americans consider themselves, most Americans consider themselves to be lonely. Now, I want to look at one of the most, what I do think is one of the most pressing public crises before our people today, and that is the crisis of addiction. Addiction is everywhere. We are addicted to our phones, to food, pornography, most distressingly to the opiate drugs that mimic the physical sensations that we naturally receive in the fulfilling moments of social connection. Andrew Sullivan explains that the oxytocin we experience from love and friendship or orgasm is chemically replicated by the molecules derived from the poppy plant. It's a shortcut and an instant intensification of the happiness we might normally experience in a good and fruitful communal life. In search of the benefits of relationship, troubled Americans are overdosing on opiate drugs at terrifying rates. Three illustrative facts from the CDC. First, in 2016, the number of overdose deaths involving opioids, including prescription opioid, opioids and illegal opioids like heroin and illicitly manufactured fentanyl, was five times higher than in 1999. Second, on average, 115 Americans die every day from opioid overdose. Third, from 1999 to 2016, more than 350,000 people died from an overdose involving any opioid, including, again, both prescription and, and illicit. 350,000 people. Let me put that in context for you. That's more than five times the nearly 60,000 Americans who died in Vietnam. Imagine the deaths of the 4,000 Americans who've died fighting in Afghanistan and the 5,000 who've died in Iraq. And then multiply that times 40. Now clearly there are economic factors. There are public health, public health, has, public health policy has played a role. There are doctors who have oversubscribed. And all of this is in part responsible for the crisis. But we have to recognize the simple fact that relief from suffering and the yearning for human connection sits at the very core the very core of America's most urgent and deadly epidemic. I say it sits at the very core, and that's a way for me to avoid attributing cause. The world is not monocausal, and it's understandable, but ultimately foolish, to desire to understand complex human phenomena in terms of a single cause. And that's true in the case of loneliness, which social scientists tend to see as an effect of deeper problems, so that we are isolated and disconnected due to inequality or the creative destruction of the market economy or the luxury that allows us to entertain ourselves to death. Any number of other political and cultural challenges might, might be at the cause. And there's a truth to this. Our institutions are only going to be strong when they're needed, when they're exercised, when they bear the weight of significance. And so when we trade in the family dinner for individual screen time while if everyone is feeding themselves, or Facebook friends for life friends, or the outrage heard on Twitter for face-to-face -face encounter. When we do these things, we should not be surprised 
when the family atrophies as an institution of significance. But perhaps the opposite also contains a truth. Perhaps our cultural challenges are just as much effects of our loneliness as they are causes of our loneliness. Facebook may be a fun diversion, but without the soul of a person enmeshed in a full and flourishing community of real friends, Facebook, fill, Facebook fills no existential longing. And feeding our faces in front of our individual screens holds no great attraction, holds no great attraction when weighed against the properly choreographed manners and mores of a family dinner. It was long thought, for example, that obesity was a cause of loneliness. Researchers now believe it is a consequence of loneliness. Now, social isolation doesn't come from nowhere. And writers, you know, from Francis Fukuyama and Charles Murray to Robert Putnam and Yuval Levin have written about the dissolution and unraveling of a mid-20th century society of consolidation. The latter half of the 20th century uh, saw Americans liberating themselves from the traditional family structures, from traditional neighborhoods, saw the beginnings, saw the beginnings of the radical remaking of labor practices and religious congregational life. And the hope was that Americans could free themselves of these oppressive and stifling modes and orders and, and, and preserve the benefits of society through connections they would choose to easily enter and exit, what we could call elective affinities. But the liberated individual, free to elect his affinities at will, found that the very freedom he'd sought also brought with it a kind of disorienting social instability. Americans in pursuit of more choice and less conformity were left longing for more enduring and abiding relationships. Now, please don't hear me say that history as a statement in opposition to freedom. Hear it instead as an effort to reckon with the consequences of the greater freedom we do indeed enjoy. I think Yuval Levin uniquely helps us see the harm we're doing to our social institutions and that that harm is bound up in the goods we are pursuing, and they are, in fact, genuine goods. We have both improved our society and damaged our society. Both and, not either or. In loosening the reins of cultural conformity and national identity and opening ourselves to an, imminent, to an immense diversity of cultures, he writes, we've weakened the roots of mutual trust. In unleashing markets to meet the needs and wants of consumers, we've freed them to treat workers as dispensable and interchangeable. In pursuing meritocracy, we've magnified inequality. In looking for a more personalized representative politics, we've propelled polarization. In seeking to treat every person equally and individually rather than forcing all to conform, we have accentuated and concentrated the differences between top and bottom in our society. In all these ways and more, as patterns of diffusion evolve into patterns of bifurcated concentration, we've done more than change the structure of institutions and relationships. We've altered the shapes of lives and souls. We've let loose a scourge of loneliness and isolation that we're still afraid to acknowledge as the distinct social dysfunction of our age. Just as crushing conformity was the characteristic scourge of an era of cohesion and unity. Ladies and gentlemen, loneliness is our problem. And to see how this form of loneliness is a specifically democratic and American problem, we have to turn now to the analysis of America's most subtle portraitist, Alexis de Tocqueville, the French aristocrat who visited the United States in the 1830s in order to see the future. The world that Tocqueville came from, the aristocratic order, was a world bound up in roles, family, honor, and memory. Many people were tyrannized by that world. Most of us were unfree. But Tocqueville saw the gradual, the, the, the gradual spread of freedom to be a providential fact. Every consequential historical act of the last thousand years advanced equality. Even the aristocratic institutions that are hierarchical, like the Catholic Church, introduced the principle of equality in Europe by selling indulgences to anyone that could pay for them, and by allowing children from any family to become a priest. So even institutions that were not themselves infused with equality, nevertheless, and sometimes without intending to do so, advanced the principle of equality. And no one could deny that the advance of equality brought with it great goods. 
Tocqueville does not deny that equality brings with it great goods. But precisely because the spread of equality is ordained, and so was coming to France, he traveled to the place where it was already most advanced in order to observe its virtues and study its characteristic vices, hoping he could guide his own country to embrace equality with freedom and avoid equality in servitude. Let's hear in Tocqueville's own words the characteristic social relations in the aristocratic world whose time he believed was slowly coming to a close. Among aristocratic nations, he, he says, families maintain the same station for centuries and often live in the same place. So there is a sense in which all the generations are contemporaneous. A man almost always knows his ancestors and respects them. His imagination extends to his great-grandchildren, and he loves them. He freely does his duty by both his ancestors and descendants and often sacrifices personal pleasures for the sake of beings who are no longer alive and not yet born. <clears throat> Aristocratic institutions have the effect of linking each man closely with several of his fellows, each class in, a, in an aristocratic society being clearly and permanently limited, forms in a sense a little fatherland for all its members to which they are attached by more obvious and more precious ties than those linking them to the fatherland itself. Each citizen of an, <clears throat> each citizen of an aristocratic society <clears throat> has his fixed station, one above another, so that there is always someone above him whose protection he needs and someone below him whose help he may require. People living in an aristocratic age, he concludes, almost always involved with something outside of themselves, and they're often inclined to forget about themselves. It's true that in these ages the general conception of human fellowship was dim and that men could hardly think of devoting themselves to the universal cause of humanity, but men do often make sacrifices for the sake of certain other men. Let me say that again. Men often make sacrifices in the aristocratic age for certain other men. This is a world whose very limits on freedom allow for intense connections, mutual interdependence, a world that had many problems, to be sure, and one should not romanticize it, but a world that does not suffer from the kind of desperate loneliness we see around us. Now let's hear how he contrasts that old world aristocracy to the, society of Democra to the democratic society he sees unfolding in the United States. In democratic ages, on the contrary, the duties of each to all are much clearer, but devoted service to any single individual much rarer. The bonds of affection are wider but more relaxed. Among democratic peoples, new families continually rise while nothing, from nothing while others fall, and nobody's position is quite stable. The woof of time is ever being broken and the track of past generations lost. Those who have gone before are easily forgotten, and no one gives a thought to those who will follow. All man's interests are limited to those near himself. He goes on, as social equality spreads, there are more and more people who, though neither rich nor powerful enough to have much hold over others, have gained or kept enough wealth and enough understanding to look after their own needs. Such people owe no man anything and hardly expect anything from anybody. They form the habit of thinking themselves in isolation and imagine their whole destiny is in their own hands. Thus, not only does democracy make men forget their ancestors, but also clouds their view of their descendants and isolates them from their contemporaries. Each man is forever thrown back on himself alone and there is danger that may, he may be shut up in the solitude of his own heart. Now, equality in freedom is a fragile achievement. It's worth striving for. But know that one of its characteristic vices is the danger of every person, every person sitting in this room, being shut up in the solitude of his own heart, alone. Now, I want you to notice something important about the way that Tocqueville describes our loneliness. It isn't only that we're all equal, and therefore we have trouble forming enduring relationships with our neighbors with our contemporaries. You might call that horizontal loneliness, the difficulty to sustain relationships in your own time. Tocqueville points out that democratic society also creates the condition for what we, we might call vertical loneliness, 
the difficulty to relate to our ancestors, the ancestors that come before us, and the descendants that will follow and succeed us. Uh, if Tocqueville is right, that the specifically democratic and American way of life makes it a little easier for us to be disconnected from our contemporaries, disconnected from our ancestors, disconnected from our descendants, then we need a remedy compatible with democracy that knits us together. It must be compatible with democracy, meaning that between equals it must allow for consent. And it must remedy the characteristic troubles of democracy, meaning that it must go beyond consent and bind us one to another in ways that endure beyond changing interests. This challenge points us toward the family. For the family is the institution that we have that sustains enduring relationships, that broadens the human heart from the self to the spouse, from the spouse to the children, and from the children to the wider ecology of care in which the fundamental human drive to be needed, to be needed and known is recognized. By helping us see both the contemporary forms of loneliness that we experience in this age of dissolution, as well as the generational forms of loneliness that we experience as a function of this age of equality, Tocqueville helps us see that the renewal of the family is the remedy we seek for the sickness we have. Now, the Hebrew Bible. All of all the great texts available to instruct our common life, I believe that none speak as directly and as powerfully as does the Hebrew Bible to the conception of the family as an answer to this deep-seated human longing as a nursery of human capacity, as a carrier of moral habits, as a vehicle to transmit a way of life and to embrace a shared destiny. Professor Berger, please forgive me. The giants of Greek antiquity, alas, cannot be the source of our instruction in the whys and wherefores of family life. For the wise men of Greece, the family is seen through the house of Atreus and the house of Oedipus. One need only study the life of Noah or Lot, and his daughters, to see that the Bible knows of this possibility, of the family as an arena of rivalry, strife, and proper sexual conduct. But when Greek philosophers strove to refine and elevate the poetry that they received as their common civilizational inheritance, by and large and for the most part, they turned to the city and to the cultivation of the intellect, to the discovery of immoral, immortal truths that live outside the world of coming into being and passing away, outside the world of time. The Hebrew Bible aspires to teach us how to live and thrive in and through history. And that living and thriving is achieved through raising and rearing the young to achieve immortality through generational inheritance. Now, familiarity with the Hebrew Bible obviously has declined in our society as it's become less religious, of course. But I know of no better text to speak to the issue, and though we read the Bible as a country less often than we once did, I know of no other country outside of the Jewish state that's better positioned to learn from its wisdom. That's because our constitutional tradition was erected in op not in opposition to the biblical tradition, and it quickly moved to protect the rights of religious exercise and thereby strengthen the hold of the biblical tradition upon the moral imagination of a great many Americans. I, uh, I, shy because I see Professor Stoner in the audience. Uh, but the question of the role of the Hebrew Bible played in the founding of America is a very big, it's a complex question in American political theory. I'm happy to discuss it in Q&A afterwards if you wish. For now, let me just postulate what I believe the evidence to actually show. That America is a double helix. That with Enlightenment and Lockean and biblical strands interwoven. We are both Cotton Mather and Benjamin Franklin, both a nation dedicated to the propositions of natural rights and a covenantal nation whose members draw on a shared history and a common future. Locke teaches us to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves, and America's alternative religious tradition teaches us, if we have the ears to hear it, to bequeath the blessings of liberty not only to ourselves but also to our posterity. Now, because America is a hybrid or amalgam of traditions, including the biblical tradition, the effort to renew and revitalize our society by breathing new life into the ideas of the Hebrew Bible is not creative as much as it is restorative. 
In turning to the Hebraic depiction of the family, we draw upon resources that have already shaped us. They're already part of our cultural DNA. So let's look at the way that the Hebrew Bible takes up this question. All of you already know the dramatic opening chapter in the book of Genesis. We see that the moral dimension there is sewn into the very fabric of creation. Now, an alternative view might be that nature is blind, set in motion and carried by its own momentum, a perfectly engineered machine of balance and counterbalance propelled by chaotic forces, but morally neutral. In the account of Genesis, each stage of creation, on the other hand, is crowned with God's moral judgment. Seven, dimension, seven dimensions of creation are called good. And God's sum total assessment of the world he has made is that it is very good. And because it's a good world, and because overall it is a very good world, the first appearance of the phrase, not good, commands our attention. The first thing called not good is loneliness. It is not good for a human to be alone. The beginning of the Bible's social wisdom is that the life of solitude into which the first man was born and from which some never escape is a life of moral impoverishment. With the birth of the individual in Genesis, in other words, something else is born. The need, the moral necessity of relationship. Now, I want to explore two dimensions of the Hebrew Bible's social teaching, beginning with the complicated relations between men and women and then looking at children. In other words, looking both at the horizontal relationships that we have with our contemporaries and the vertical ones we inherit and are responsible for passing on to those that come after us. First, let's talk about men and women. What are the human issues at stake in the way that the Bible presents it? After pronouncing that man's goodness is bound up with his sociality, God makes woman. I shall make him a sustainer beside him. It's necessary to delve into the Hebrew phrase that I think the preeminent Hebrew translator Robert Alter renders sustainer to fully bring out the social dynamic that's being born here. Woman is ezer kanegedo, a help, ezer, but a help that is kanegedo, against him or over and against him. As Rabbi Jonathan Sachs reads it, the fact that the woman is both potentially with and against man, it's clear from this that she's a separate self, a person, an equal, not a subordinate to the male. The fact that the woman is born of man and able to complement him, but also born of man and able to oppose him, proves that she has her own will, her own choices to make, her own integrity, and therefore her own responsibility. The woman's autonomy is evinced in her subsequent actions in Eden, for however one evaluates them, they're born of her own choice and free will, and they demonstrate a person equal to, and to be honest, if not in some way superior to, the man. The fact of her freedom forces us to confront the most fundamental question of all social life. If to live well, human beings require community, and if each individual person created in the image and likeness of God is endowed with freedom, then the question is, how can there be a stable and ordered relationship between two free individuals? Now, Rabbi Sachs observes that in the Bible's ideal, relationships lie not in power, but in the bond of mutually ma made possible by language. A relationship that depends on dominance, physical, economic, political dominance, is not one between free agents. If I have power over you, my will prevails at the expense of yours. You are a means to my end. Thus, this fails the biblical test of treating each person as a creation in the image and likeness of God. It also fails to redeem solitude. For if I regard you as an extension of me, not a person in your own right, I'm still alone. The fact of freedom is now complicated by the fact of power, because men are physically stronger than women, usually, and can force them into submission. So how can the bond between these two, free and equal in some ways, but unequal in others, achieve the society that each require to live well? Now, the Hebrew Bible's analysis of the relationship between man and woman can be seen as a proxy, as a proxy for its analysis of the proper relationship between all individuals or groups with agency and unequal power. 
Throughout Genesis, the Bible patiently and systematically presents the reader with competing visions of this relationship and the cultures that grow out of it. By and large, and for the most part, that is shown through sex. Sexual dynamics inside the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchal family, are opposed in the Bible's presentation by the sexual dynamics of their neighbors. The patriarchal family's encounter with foreign sexual practices sets before the reader competing social theories about the right relationship of men and women one to another. There is a type scene repeated three times in Genesis in which famine, natural necessity, forces the patriarchal family to look for sustenance outside of Canaan. Each time the patriarchal family encounters outsiders, members of other tribes, other regimes, each time a patriarch is forced to ask his wife to lie and say that she is his sister. And it happened as he drew near to the border of Egypt that he said to Sarai, this is Av Avram, look, I know you're a beautiful woman. And so when the Egyptians see you, say, she's his wife, and they'll kill me while you let me live. Well, you, they will let live. In the next generation, when Isaac is forced to rely on the Philistines in Gerar, he said that Rebekah was his sister, fearing to say, my wife, lest the men of the place kill me over Rebekah, for she is comely to look at. The sexual enticement of beautiful women is powerful enough to kill for. Lust moves men to murder. The sexual drive unleashes death, in this case, rather than life. In Egypt and Gerar, women and all those with less power than the monarch are his commodities. They serve at the pleasure of his power. And by treating all others as his subordinates and servants, the monarch remains without an equal partner with whom he can enjoy the bond, the bonds vanquished by solitude. Neither the subjects nor the tyrants nor in turn the societies of which they are part know the companionship that alone can redeem loneliness. Now, in Abraham's generation, Lot offers his virgin daughters to the would-be rapists in, Sod in S Saddam as substitutes for raping the guests in his own home. After their miraculous salvation, the daughters, knowing how their father values their lives, seduce and fornicate him with an ugly episode of incestuous justice. Three generations later, one of the pivotal moments of the Joseph story occurs when, working for Potiphar, his master's wife beckons him to lie, lie with me. In encounter after encounter, the sexual morality outside the patriarchal family is anarchic and associated in the biblical text with murder, abduction, incest, rape, and all the other depravities one could imagine. In each case, the sexual relationship indicates deeper attitudes that govern all human relationships. When we pray on the weak, when the strong pray on the weak, as the lusty mob of Sodom sought to prey on Lot's daughters, or as the wife of Potiphar sought to prey on Joseph. They see, their, their, they see their target as an instrument of their own passions, as a means to their own ends, as an object of use, rather than a person with equal dignity. The sexual encounter contains within it the seeds of all the other social relationships, and if not immediately, then eventually, sexual proprieties will affect the entire society. And so, Sex must be moralized into marriage. And marriage is the answer to the question that the creation of Eve forces us to confront. How do free, pe free persons of unequal power take it upon themselves to form reliable and stable association while preserving the dignity of each one and also transform them into something more? It's the covenantal bond that reconciles freedom and association. Now, this is not the marriage in the modern sense, as we tend to think about the nuclear family now. Husbands and wives in the Hebrew Bible were not always, or in fact, were not often, akin to the families that we see around us. This is worth dwelling on because the diversity of family arrangements portrayed in the Bible is vast. Abraham, by my count, Abraham, Gideon, Nahor, Jacob, Eliphaz, Caleb, Menashe, and Solomon all had at least one and sometimes multiple concubines in addition to his wife. Lamech, Esau, Jacob, Asher, Gideon, Elkanah, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, and others had multiple wives. Slave owners could give female slaves to male slaves and then maintain them as property, uh, maintain as property the wife and children that in turn 
came from them. Israelite soldiers took tribeswomen of defeated clans. A rapist could acquire his victim as a wife. And perhaps what's most unusual to modern ears is the practice of leveret marriage, whereby one brother is legally bound to marry a deceased brother's wife in order to raise up the seed, that's a quote, in his name. Okay, I want to acknowledge that, to be honest, but let me say that the existence of these family arrangements in the Bible, about which there can be no dispute, does not mean that the biblical authors advocate or defend the existence of these relationships. I'm not going to get into this. Uh, we can talk about it afterwards if you wish, but let me just say that one has to read the entire narrative of the patriarchal families and Leviticus 17 through 19 together to see how the halachic tradition, the Jewish legal tradition, redeems this imperfect and at times ruinous family structure. So what, if not these depraved family forms, what is the positive vision and the positive teaching about the bond between husband and wife? Let's pick up where we left off with the first woman and man in Eden. The body of woman is brought out from the body of man, and as Leon Cass notes, recalling Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it is man's sight of woman that first elicits poetry in the world. This one at last, the man says, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this one shall be called woman, Isha, for from man, Ish, was this one taken. The woman delivers man at last from a longing and a need. She is like him, of his kind, a counterpart. And then we read, Therefore does a man leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they become one flesh. That sentence contains multitudes. We're going to spend a minute on it now. Let's go through some of the questions that it raises. The sentence is said not by the man or by the woman, nor presumably by God, who is not introduced as the author of that sentence. The word therefore, the word that begins this oracular passage, is etiological. What is the argument or explanation that this sentence resolves? What is to be made of the mention of father and mother, an anachronism, given that at this time in the world there are no fathers and mothers? What is implied and what does it mean for a man to leave his parents? What does it mean to become one flesh? Who articulates this profound statement of identity, purpose, and social teaching? Evidently, it's reported by an omniscient narrative voice. That's rare in Genesis. But if it is authoritative, what does it say and what does it mean? First, the man here described is known through his relationships. Our relationships and our ongoing connections with others comprise our identity. Each person is a node of associations and is inescapably informed and molded by the totality of these associations. Even the man's departure from his parents, described later in this sentence, is not a departure into solitude, but from one relationship to another. The relationship that originally defines man is the one into which he is literally born. The introduction of the relation between parent and child, at this point in the biblical text, before the advent of motherhood and fatherhood, is suggestive. Parenthood has been implied, even commanded, immediately following the first creation of man and woman, when they are told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But here there's the introduction of something beyond procreation and reproduction. Father and mother is a unit, and a family that has nurtured and claimed the primary attachment of the child. This means that father and mother are partners beyond the sexual encounter, in roles that persist over time. Second, marriage and parenthood as relationships are conceived before Adam ever knows Eve. The placement of parenthood, father and mother, before the sexual encounter clings to his wife, and before the act occurs in the actual text that we're reading, is not only a chronological description, but I believe it's a teleological prescription. It's chronological truth, of course, that, that um, a child must be born and raised before he can enter into sexual relationships. Existentially, that's just a banal truth. But it serves here as a teleological statement signaling that the purpose of the sexual encounter is to have this child and raise him up. By framing the sexual encounter in the context of the family, 
The biblical author is introducing something that is to be sustained throughout the rest of the biblical text. It's a, a thread that one could trace all the way through. Now, although the sexual relationship itself is not bad, a, a valence it will later acquire in other religious traditions, and although it enables man to fulfill the first commandment to be fruitful and multiply, nevertheless, Scripture is careful to praise and condemn specific kinds of sexual relationships. At the most fundamental level, the sexual activity motivated primarily by the hedonic impulse is a degradation and requires the redemption through building and raising up of a family. In this verse, the establishment of parenthood to the sec prior to the sexual act prescribes the purpose and end of the sexual act. Third, the child grown in, into a man leaves his parents. Now, one of the great biblical interpreters of the rabbinic tradition, Rashi, interprets this phrase legally. The, the, fra the phrase warns mankind, well before God does explicitly says anything about the matter, of the dangers and the immor immorality of incestuous copulation. But I think a psychological interpretation is more compelling. As one of the great uh, biblical scholars of the 20th century, Umberto Casuto, notes that the tense of the verb yatsov suggests not a single point in time, but constant and continuing action. And so the departure from one's parents did not happen at once. It is always happening. Man's departure from mother and father suggests a refinement and deepening of the idea that our identity is the product of our relationships, our past, our history, that we are inescapably encumbered. The departure from mother and father suggests that prior to that departure, man was attached to them. The departure from mother and father, as students here living away, some of you for the first time, know it's a titanic shift in human consciousness and one, one of the most consequential inflection points in human life to leave home for the first time and see yourself outside of that context. Now, one implication of that is that man is born into a family he did not choose. The original condition of each and every person born of woman is unavoidable, given, and faded. But when the child replaces his primary attachment to his parents with the attachment to his spouse, he replaces givenness with choice. As Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik writes, the marital community replaces the parental community. Until one's marriage, the young man or woman belonged to a parental community consisting of three personae, the husband, the wife, and the child. On the day of their marriage, they leave the community into which they were cast by the Almighty and substitute for it a marital community which they enter voluntarily by free choice. Each individual was shaped and educated from child to adult in a way he did not choose, but with the onset of sexual maturity and marriage, he chooses his adult partner. Now finally, having chosen each other, the man and woman cling together and become one flesh. Now one might read that phrase, one flesh, not as the man and woman coming together in intercourse, but as the child itself, the product of that intercourse, the integrated embodiment of the two parents. But however one reads it, as the act of or the result of intercourse, man and woman become one in the rearing of the child, the commitment to the child's well-being, education, and moral cultivation. It's through mutual commitment to the common project of forming a new life that they become one. The unity of the parents based on their choice and their achievement is the next generation's unchosen original condition. And that brings us back to the first word, therefore. To what question does this sentence offer a response, an answer? To what tension does this verse offer a resolution? Well, remember back that poem that I read, the poem of Genesis 2.23. It celebrates the shared origins of man and woman. When man's drive to unite with another in intimacy or sexual passion or both is directed solely at his partner. When that's the case, their bond is incomplete. Without the children of verse 24, the poetry and romance of verse 23 is a more sterile pleasure. Without the projection of children into the future, the momentary bond is at risk. And without the calling to perpetuate the story of one's family, the past can seem to be in vain. Reliability over time is the truth of the covenantal bond. Verse 23 paints a picture of deep natural passion consummated. Verse 24 moralizes sex into marriage 
creating husband and wife from man and woman, and holding forth a promise of creating father and mother from husband and wife. So now let's turn to that, to the command to have children, the very first one given to mankind by God in Scripture. If they're able, man and woman are obliged to have children. And while husband and wife consummate their relationship in physical space, by becoming parents, they create new life in time. Let's look at the blessings to just see this, that Isaac confers on his son, Jacob. These blessings articulate the mature wisdom of a long and weathered life. The blessings encapsulate the most ardently felt wishes of a man for his, children, for his son, and they serve the educational function of presenting their, his son with a final aspiration. Now, Isaac actually blesses Jacob twice, and comparing the two blessings sheds light on the seriousness with which the biblical authors, biblical fathers, sought sons for their sons. See, first, Jacob deceives his elderly father. You'll, re you'll remember it, he steals the blessing that was meant for Esau, Isaac's firstborn son. Isaac, his senses failing him and believing that he was speaking to Esau, blesses Jacob by asking that God grant him, quote, from the dew of the heavens and the fat of the earth and abundance of grain and drink. May peoples serve you and nations bow before you. Be overlord to your brothers. May your mother's sons bow before you. Those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you, blessed. Isaac had favored Esau over Jacob his elder son, Esau, was stronger, more, vigor, more vigorous. He brought Isaac choice game from the field. And as is often the case with men of great physical prowess, Esau's character and consciousness accentuated his strengths. Powerful enough to get what he wanted, Esau was not given to patience. So reliant on quick bursts of energy and strength, on the need to sublimate rational processes and act on instinct to lose himself in the moment, Esau was intensely oriented toward the present, not the future. That's why he's willing to sell his birthright, a claim to future place, to his craftier, perhaps slightly effeminate, younger brother, to satisfy a present passing craving. Now, Isaac's blessing enhances Esau's way of life. It voices a hope that Esau, though again it's bestowed unknowingly to Jacob, will continue to reap the best of food to fill the belly. The dew of heavens and the fat of the earth, Isaac's hope for Esau is for plentiful grain and rewarding hunt. May people serve you. Be overlord to your brothers. That's a hope for political prowess. Isaac's first blessing, in short, is about power, for the use of the earth and preeminence among men. Now, after the hoax of Rebekah and, and, and uh, Jacob has been revealed, and Jacob is sent to flee his wrathful brother for commandeering Esau's birthright, Isaac blesses him a second time. But this time, fully awake and his senses fully alive to Jacob's true identity, Isaac offers a blessing of a very different kind. You shall not take a wife from among the daughters of Canaan, he says. Rise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, Bethuel, your mother's father, and take you from there a wife from the daughters of Laban, your, your mother's brother. And may El Shaddai bless you and make you fruitful and multiply. So you become an assembly of peoples. May he grant you the blessings of Abraham to you and your seed as well, that you may take hold of the land of your sojournings, which God granted to Abraham. This is a blessing for a suitable, for a suitable partner and children. It brings, to mind, it brings to Jacob's mind his grandfather, whom he never knew, Abraham. And it brings to mind and even names his grandfather's God. It brings to Jacob's mind, in other words, the extraordinary family, which is now his responsibility to carry forward. It's little wonder that this second proper blessing was prompted, at least in part, by Rebekah. For Isaac's first blessing was for power in time. His second blessing, perhaps influenced by, by Isaac's wife, conveyed in full awareness of its recipient and his new family obligations for prosperity through time. Now, the blessings for children are sometimes frustrated by natural causes, and despite the challenges of infertility, which feature prominently in all of the major figures of biblical history, um, they become parents eventually. The struggle with infertility, 
I think su suffered by a matriarch in each generation, moves Hana many generations later in anguish to offer the first recorded prayer. Later, God will promise that once the Israelites arrive in the land that it's promised to them, there shall be no woman miscarrying or barren in your land. Everyone tries to heed the commandment to be fruitful and multiply, and the arrival of children, the flowering of generations, is a blessing. In the words of the psalmist, may you see the children of your own children. Now children are at once the purpose of man and woman, and they are the carriers of Israel's distinctive covenantal morality. Physically having children is not enough. Biological prop propagation must be complemented with education. Now, to remind mankind of, his, mankind of his first covenant with Noah, God provides a universal physical token, the rainbow. But actually, God goes well beyond this. When God encourages Moses to return to Pharaoh and again demand Israelite freedom, not for the first time, note the explanation that God gives for why he has adopted the method of plagues and the dramatic human drama that's, that's playing out before them. Come into Pharaoh, for I myself has hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, so that I may set these signs of mine in his midst, and so that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son how I toyed with Egypt and my signs that I set upon them, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This statement signals a profound insight into the nature of human learning. The people cannot simply be told a story, which it will be their responsibility to repeat. Man cannot just retain words alone. Spectacle is needed. For the memory to be truly embedded in the consciousness of this people, more than treatise or command or even story was needed, to the extent that there is a biblical epistemology, it's framed by this. Conscious knowledge of the world is not born of disembodied thought, but of gradual disclosure of the world itself. When accepting the law from God at Sinai, the Israelites proclaim, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will heed. Doing precedes heeding. Being precedes consciousness. So the mnemonic strategy combines acts, rituals, deeds with stories and pronouncements. Everything is needed. Threats and at times actual force will be necessary. And sometimes there will be people who simply cannot learn, for even parents have limited powers when it comes to, the, to in the words of Deuteronomy, the wayward and rebellious son. At any rate, the Israelites in future times do indeed heed God's call and recall his spectacles in Egypt. In the words of Deuteronomy, has God tried to come <clears throat> to take him a nation from within a nation in trials and signs and portents and in battle and with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terrors? like all the Lord your God did for you before you're in Egypt before your eyes? Okay, armed with the miraculous breaks in the structure of nature, spectacles cannot be repeated or reproduced by human hands. Israel is equipped with a responsibility to repeat and recall the story of their deliverance. And in so doing, in so shaping the memory of their children, Israel is equipped to sustain its collective existence into the future. Worship is one method of remembrance and education. Requesting leave from Pharaoh, Moses specifies that it is with our lads and with our old men we will go, with our sons and with our daughters. But many years before, God seems to have chosen Abraham for his willingness to charge his sons and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord and do righteousness. Another method is for the nation to institute holidays, which regularly recur and remind celebrants not of natural phenomenon, but of historical phenomenon. And this day shall be a remembrance for you, in the words of Exodus. And you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord through your generations. An everlasting statute shall you celebrate it. But the main method, the main method of rehearsing the past will not be in worship or celebration. The main method will be when children ask of their elders. In the course of daily life, around the family table, in a thousand interactions and discussions. The text, I think displaying a high degree of self-awareness, preempts such conversations with explicit instructions for parents. Your son may ask you such and such. On that day, you shall say so and so. Should your children ask you on the morrow, saying, 
What are these stones to you? You shall say that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. When it was crossing over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones became a memorial for Israel forever. Again, not a natural phenomenon, but a, a part of our story that we have a responsibility to, to pass on to our children. Alongside this formula lies a variation that in, indicates a pervasive anxiety and anxiety in Israelite culture. Rather than educate the young in the ways of the old, the old themselves might forget. Amnesia is the fear and the anxiety. And the text most fears amnesia that comes from assimilation into non-Israelite culture, a culture with different gods, with different understandings, and different commitments. Watch yourself, lest you forget the Lord your God and not keep his commands and his laws and his statutes that I charge you this day. Lest you eat and be sated and build goodly houses and dwell in them, unless you get too comfortable. And your cattle and your sheep multiply, and the silver and gold multiply for you, and all that you have multiply, that you become too decadent. And that your heart shall become haughty, and you forget the Lord your God, who brings you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slaves, who leads you through the great and terrible wilderness, viper serpents and scorpions and thirst, where there's no water, that you become, in other words, too prideful and forget the memory of the past. Throughout, forgetfulness is contrasted with the wisdom of the fathers, the fear that alien culture will affect forgetfulness of the Israelite deliverance, and the covenantal regime is simply another way of expressing how bound up that regime is with the memory and the constant rehearsal of its past. Okay, the clearest example of that kind of assimilation occurs with Joseph in Egypt. Joseph's rise to the vice regency makes him the assimilated Israelite par excellence. And to Joseph, two sons were born before the coming of the year of famine, whom Asenat, Asenat daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, these Egyptian names, bore him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Menashe, meaning God has released me from the debt of hardship and all of my father's house. Joseph, along with his wife, the daughter of an Egyptian priest, names their eldest son exactly what you would expect someone fleeing their inheritance, trying to flee their inheritance. And to undo this in the larger drama of Israelite history, it will take the reunification of Jacob and Joseph, father and son, Jacob's legal adoption of Joseph's son as his own. Remember the days of old, Give thoughts to the years of times past. Ask your father that he may tell you, and your elders that they may say to you. That is the sum and substance of the purpose of children in the view of Deuteronomy. Ladies and gentlemen, we've not yet discussed the role of memory, the Bible's insistence on what social scientists call path dependency, or the intransigencies of family characteristics that endure through generations. We have not discussed the nation and how the family blossoms into a family of families. But the crucial insight of the Hebrew Bible's social thought is that good, healthy, full life, that of an individual and that of another, the thing we haven't had time to discuss, as I say, the nation, is a life of relationship. None more crucial than that of husband and wife that blossoms into mother and father and therefore can point toward the future. The Hebrew Bible explores and extols the family, and it is, in my view, the most compelling answer to the loneliness under which we Americans languish. The family is the core character-forming institution of every human society, Yuval Levin writes. It is the primary source of the most basic order, structure, discipline, support, and loving guidance that every human being requires. It's simply essential for human flourishing. And its weakening puts at risk the very possibility of a society worthy of the name. Now, perhaps public policy can play a marginal role, a marginal role in improving the family formation of Americans. Perhaps it can help families nourish and educate their children. Let me just take this opportunity to salute Senator Mike Lee's social capital project, which he's running out of the Senate's Joint Economic Committee. But the point is not to mandate family policy or use the tools of legislation to enforce actions that oblige Americans to behave like religious Christians and Jews. The sources of Americans' loneliness are deeper than politics, and so we'll need to look deeper than politics for its solution. 
I'm talking about the cultivation of face-to-face relationships. To marry, to have and love children, to expand the aperture of our consciousness so that what we've inherited from our mothers and fathers is present to us, and to safeguard what we owe to our descendants so that it should be present to them. This is to attune ourselves to a different kind of reality. Let me say one need not be a religious believer and one need not be a traditional Christian or Jew to embrace the reality of relationship. But to embrace the reality of relationship with moral confidence is to affirm the truths that the Hebrew Bible can uniquely offer to, to a uniquely American form of loneliness. I began by telling you, reminding you, sadly, that in the last month these three lonely men terrorized our nation. The man who sent explosives through the mail was briefly married and then divorced in a matter of months. He literally disappeared and his wife could not find him. So to make their separation official, her lawyer put public notice of their divorce in the newspaper. The anti-Semite who stormed the Pittsburgh synagogue grew up in the shadow of his father's tragic suicide when he was seven years old. And the troubled ex-Marine who set his target on college students in California, lost his father to cancer when he was a young boy. After marrying at the age of 19, he and his wife divorced when he was 24. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not good for man to be alone. Thank you, Professor Berger, for inviting me to Tulane this evening. And thank you all for the willingness to entertain the idea that an ancient Hebrew text can help replenish the civil society on which our American destiny depends. The story of Jacob and Rachel. To my mind, it's such a sad tale of the tension between love and children. So, as you say, every matriarch is barren, but in that case, that seems to be the whole theme of the story, that conflict. So that's one thorn in the side of the harmonizing of love and, and children and, and family. And the other thing, of course, undeniable is sibling rivalry. It's so remarkable to me how that's such a ubiquitous theme of Genesis. What do we make of that about the family? What is the teaching of that? Uh, let me... Um... Let me think with you about Jacob and Rachel. Um, those, those of you all will remember that the true beloved of Jacob, Rachel, was barren. And because of a complicated backstory, he actually has two wives, also Rachel's sister. So um, Leah, the woman that he kind of loves less, is fertile and gives Jacob a lot of children. And Leah's handmaid also gives Jacob a lot of children. And Rachel's handmaid gives him some children. But Rachel, only a few. And the, this is a big family disaster. It's actually, I'm, I'm trying to think, um, along with the story of Joseph, among the, the longest, takes up the most column inches in the text of Genesis. And I think the point is to um, teach, the, to, to hold up the moral teaching. This is a departure from the single man and single woman that we saw in Adam and Eve, and to show us that um, when there is polygamy, there, there is a quality of, in, there is an inequality built into that relationship, which is unjust to everyone involved, except the man. It's good for the man, but it's bad for the women. And I think the Bible is coming down very strongly on the side of the women in this case, and against the, inter, the narrow interests of the man. As I say, all of the uh, patriarchal stories of Genesis have to be read in light of what I think. They're all disasters, by the way. But basically, they're all disasters. They're all critiques of different kinds of marriage that you might, you might see. I think they are all redeemed in the legal texts of Leviticus that revisit and, I think, correct the, prob- the portraits that you see there. Um, yeah, bro- brothers are complicated. Um, coming from the same Adelphos, coming from the same womb. Um, this was a rivalry certainly known to the Greeks as well as to the Hebrew tradition. And um, I don't think that there's a good resolution for it. 
By the way, one thing I've pondered and have no uh, suggestion about is, I think the dominant theme of Greek tragedy is the Oedipal story of the tension between uh, son and father and son. And over against that, the Hebrew Bible is so focused on ri sibling rivalry, brothers and sisters. It's just, it's, it's worth thinking about why those two different family dysfunctions. Let, let me tell you, let me offer a Hebraic match to the dysfunction of Oedipus. Okay. The first conversation between the preeminent father, Abraham, the man chosen because he had the qualities and characteristics to be a great father, the first conversation he has with his son is at the moment when he's about to sacrifice his son. It is also their last conversation. And Isaac only sees Abraham again in his life when he and Ishmael come together to bury him after his death. So that I, I, do, I don't want to be heard as offering a triumphalist reading of the biblical family, which, is not, which the, Bible, the Hebrew Bible does not romanticize the family, not even a little. And yet, and yet, for all of the challenges, because all of us are broken, and forming these relationships take a great deal, with all those challenges notwithstanding, it is the one thing we need to save us. I wanted to ask you uh, about why it is that you think that the Hebrew Bible doesn't restrict itself to a discussion of the family, but goes on in Exodus to introduce something that's not family, political reality. And uh, you'd said early on, you know, the Greeks don't have a lot to say in the way the Hebrew Bible does about the family. And yet we know that, for example, in the case of Aristotle, there's family, but there's also uh, the city, the political society. Yeah. And I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are, given the centrality of the family that you've depicted so well tonight uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Why is there a need to go beyond it? Because it's a great question. I, I think actually the, that early moment in Aristotle's politics where attention, careful attention is paid to the prerequisite of family life before the city, is of a piece with, uh, Aristotle's a very wise person, and it's of a piece with, I think, this biblical insight. I guess my, my, my response to, to the Greek tradition is that it's just not, it's, the Greeks don't care about it. I mean, it's not, they care about the preeminence of the polis and what virtues are required for the polis to succeed. Um, and the, the Hebrew Bible is, is training its eyes on a different set of human questions. Now, it's not the only set of human questions that the Hebrew Bible trains its eyes upon. Um, my answer to the question, what does America right now at this moment need to learn most from the Hebrew Bible? My answer to that question is the family. But you could easily imagine another time in American history, another regime in which we, needed, we, could, we could hear other biblical lessons about federalism about equality, about equality both under the law and, equal, and, and natural equality, equality rooted in the fact that we're all created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, there, and, and by the way, political thinkers, I mean, this is, this is a big subject now, political thinkers have mined the biblical text looking for inspiration um, for a very long time. So I think that the Hebrew Bible does in fact offer an account of the rise of the Israelite nation it offers us a couple, I'd say, say three or four different competing models of political leadership, each with its characteristic vices and virtues. Um, but I don't think, in my, in my view, um, I love and admire and learn from the scholars of the Hebrew Bible that have looked for political wisdom in the text. But, I, but my view now is that to read the book of Exodus as the account of the founding and the development of a nation just doesn't speak to the American crises, crises 
that we're living through right now. And that's what I want to think about. Are you including non-traditional families in that definition? For instance, like a stepfather in place of a father, or two mothers rather than a father? It's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. Um, it's, not, it's not the way that the, it's not the main biblical concern. And, and I think for most Americans, there, 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 are some, there are many Americans for whom that is a concern. And you could easily imagine what you call non-traditional families fulfilling the role that I tried to ascribe here, um, not born of nature in the same way that the, that the bringing together of man and woman does, but fulfilling the fundamental role, which is carrying a kind of moral education from the past and perpetuating it into a future. You could easily imagine that, and that certainly in the case of adoption, but in other kinds of family situations as well. It's not the Bible's main focus. I, I don't want to speculate on the biblical text without any evidence. Obvious challenge with using the Bible as to uh, invoke what we consider to be family values or monogamy is that the stories it actually describes and the society it actually describes are so strange. So it looks like there's a disconnect between, uh, I suppose, the law given in Leviticus and uh, the various descriptions of biblical families, none of which are monogamous and all of which are uh, dysfunctional, to use a modern term. So would it be more maybe helpful to look at, for example, rabbinic Judaism or certain interpretations of the Bible? Because um, again, it just seems to me that the biblical stories you know, describe a society that is so alien. And secondly, and perhaps a related question, why don't we just turn to Locke? He describes a, a nice bourgeois family. The, uh, father prepares the son for freedom and responsibility. They're tied together by sober financial concerns. They're not irresponsible with uh, drugs or all kinds of wild sex. Uh, so why is it that sufficient and perhaps more, well, less remote anyway than the Bible? It's cer certainly less remote than the Bible, to start with Locke. Um, certainly less remote than the Bible. But of course, that's the whole problem. Um, the, the whole problem is that the, the Lockean description of the family is so fundamentally, uh, falls so fundamentally short when, it, when, when compared to the biblical standards that I've tried to bring out of the text. It's exactly as you say, when the son reaches the age of nunnage, then they have no, in, they have no inherent connection one to another any longer. And be, if the father does his job well, this is the tragic dimension of the Lockean family, if the father does his job well and actually educates his son with the right faculties of reasoning, then there is no inherent need for them to be related one any longer. And so if your concern is to widen the aperture of our relationships and remain in enduring relationships that persist from generation to generation, then it would be foolish to say that Locke is responsible for American loneliness, that's not true. But that's not the source I would go to to try and, and reaffirm or strengthen the American family. Though it is, as you say, closer. Which is all the more reason why, it all the, is so, more, so much str more striking and unusual and strange that Americans have read the Bible. Sola, scrip sola scriptura style in ways that traditional Christians and Jews would, it would drive them crazy, but Americans are crazy. And Americans have read the Bible as a text of moral and political wisdom, perhaps, perhaps as insistently and carefully and lovingly than any other people. And so near where I live, there's a place called Bethesda, and if you drive around New England, you, you drive through Bethel and Canaan and, and Jericho, and, and because the people who settled the, those parts of the country thought that they were coming to like a Hebrew fantasy camp. And it's amazing. But that is a deep strain in the biblical inheritance. It's the reason why, for all of the foreignness, I think that there's a chance that, first of all, in the substance, I think it's the best guide that we have. But because of that deep American strain of biblical liter literacy, it's something I think could be recovered as it's already part of our DNA. Between Tocqueville's vertical loneliness and horizontal loneliness, contrasting the two, do you think that one of those is a more pressing issue to solve currently in America? And also, do you think that there's a difference in how we should go about solving both of them? 
I think that there's a difference at different stages of life. That, that I mean, this is, this is the whole business of uh, that a man should leave his mother and father and, and join with his wife and they'll together become one flesh. That there's a stage of life in which the vertical, lo- the vertical connections are easy and present if family is formed well. That's a big if, big if in America today. Across all races, across all cra- classes. It's a big, not across all, across all classes, but ac- certainly cl- across religious traditions and races. Um, but at that stage of life, in an earlier stage of life, and when parents are young parents, it's easier to be in a generation where grandparents are alive, God willing, and you are responsible for these young children, and they live in a world where there's multiple generations above them. That's a kind of natural, best case scenario condition. When children get, when people get older, like, just to, to put this into context, I know that there's, there's different kinds of students in, in the room tonight. Um, it's often the case, often the case, that an undergraduate can go through their four years at Tulane or anywhere and not really have a major family crisis because their, fa- their parents are, are generally young and healthy, God willing. But some of you will, will suffer and punish yourselves and go to graduate school. And when you suffer and punish yourself and go to graduate school, people are in their, people are in their late 20s and their 30s, and there are things that happen in families. There are things that happen in families. It's a different stage of life when some of the proximity that we have, now speaking about the vertical, vertical relationships, some of that can start to dissipate and fray. I think when you're an adult, and you're just sitting by yourself on Facebook, it's a real, pro- that, that's an adult stage when you've not formed your own family yet and the, the connections you have to the older generation are already starting to be, you're both adults, it's, like, it's different. Okay, and, the ch- and you don't yet have children. It's a sta- to me, it's a stage of life thing. Coming from Israel, uh, where families are very, very strong and one lives in proximity to them all your life, you can't really move far away. I uh, truly appreciate what you say, and I feel it when coming to America that it's more difficult to have an extended family and, uh, or to have a close relationship with one's family, which sort of uh, uh, offsets loneliness and offsets a lot of social ills. That I agree with you, and I've seen that also in other countries where families are strong. And yet, uh, coming from Israel, I also sense that once, and let's say 40 years ago, Loneliness was offset by a lot of voluntary groups, political groups, aesthetic groups, people. um, There's something I think very noble about coming together with people who are like-minded, not just because you were born to them, but because you have an idea together. You have, you you believe, let's say, in modernism, or you believe in, in a certain aesthetic, or you believe in a political platform, and suddenly a group of total strangers comes together and they treat each other like family, and they share, and they do a lot of things. The kibbutz is another group like that, which uh, actually played down the family very strongly in order to create other affinities. And people were not lonely there. People were, were filled with motivation. One can say that poverty and, and uh, drugs and other problems were non-existent in such affinitive or elective, what did you call it? Uh, le- right. Elective uh, uh, groups. and so. I was wondering why the answer in your talk to all these social ills of fragmentation, social fragmentation, has to be the traditional family and not, uh, why can't we create other affinities in which we can uh, blossom as human beings in, in, in interconnectedness? It's a great, great question. It's a great question. Um, the thing that struck Tocqueville even more than the than the democratic reforms to the family is this tradition of forming, forming associations. So it has a deep root also here in the United States. Um, would, that it, would that it would be revived and be stronger, there's nothing but good that comes from that kind of face-to-face sacrifice to a greater, a greater purpose. So I don't think these things are intention. Um, but, but still, you're asking a more searching question, which is, so fine, they're not intention, that's also a good thing. But why do you say that family is more fundamental? And the reason I think that family is more fundamental is because you can't leave 
that Boy Scout troop. You just can't. Not in the same way. And Boy Scouts is a great thing. Um, that's so female in Israel. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. But you can leave. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.